Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Map Round Show. This is the Secrets of Fail series where we are talking to successful CEOs uh, all about their epic business failures uh, and everything they've learned about the process or in that process. So uh, with us today uh, in the hot seat is none other than the man, the legend, Shannon Scott. He is the uh, founder and uh, CEO of HR Logics. Shannon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Anytime, dude. So let's start with the elevator pitch. Uh, what exactly are you guys up to there at HR Logics? Well, what we're what we're trying to do is kind of change uh, the compliance industry in the United States. You know, obviously, employers have to deal with a lot of rules and regulations everywhere from the IRS to the Department of Labor, and um, it's quite a complex and, and cumbersome process to do that internally through HR departments. So, what we've done is created a set of tools and platforms which automate a lot of those processes and reporting to you know the IRS, Department of Labor, immigration to make sure that you're hiring people properly, you're keeping yourself out of trouble. I mean, we like to say basically in a nutshell what we do is we cover your ass, right? We're making sure that you're not getting fined and, and you're 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 doing things the legal and compliant way when hiring and terminating employees. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. How long have you guys been uh, around for? So I, we've been in this industry, a lot of, a lot of our executive teams have been in this industry for like 20 years in the HR tech space. This particular company that we've started has been around since 2020. Wow. Okay, cool. Also, if you're interested, guys, head on over to HR Logics and uh, watch how everything personalizes itself for you. <laughs> uh, very cool stuff. Well, look, Shannon, let's get into the meat and the potatoes of this one, buddy. Uh, what is your epic story of fail for our audience around the world today? Well, my epic story of fail, and trust me, I've got a few. Um, you know, I've learned a lot of lessons, but you know, I always say you find you know focus in failure. Um, it was in 2018, I think it's my last company that I sold. Uh, made a lot of mistakes, got a little cocky, and uh, and and I paid for it. I suffered for it greatly. It's a, it's a very interesting story. Go for it. All right. So um, essentially, just a thirty thousand foot view. We. You know, I've been in again in this space. I've built and sold over 15 companies in this HR tech space. So every single time I'm either acquiring an organization or taking a liquidity event, I always learn a lot. And, and and that is number one is make sure that you are, you know, crossing every you know crossing every T and checking every you know dot on every contract. And those things are legal things. Those things are things you should take care. of. Uh, but what you do, what you tend to miss sometimes is the smaller things, the minutiae, right? The how are my employees going to be treated? Are my employees going to be given long-term contracts? You know, how, if you're owning real estate, which I did at the time, how is my real estate going to be treated? Are these leases going to be honored when this, these companies are acquiring? Um, so what we did is we went into a major acquisition with a company who's been in this space for a very long time, and they absolutely just hammered us post-sale. You know, what I mean by that is every single promise that we thought was going to be made just wasn't made. Consider, you know, give you a few examples. One is... We were told that they would retain our employees for a minimum of two years. It took about two months before they went in and fired every single one of our employees. And you know, the reaction was basically sue me, right? Um, you know, we had a we had them sign a ten year lease um, on on the buildings that we owned so that they could occupy those properties. Of course, they broke that lease. Um, you know, not only that, but then they stopped making payments to us on the earnouts. Um, so it, it was just a major and, and quite frankly, what we did is we made the mistake of going into this because we were promised as sellers of the organization that we would ma maintain board seats. Right. But when we accepted those board seats at the new company, we now became fiduciary responsibly uh, we're responsible for that organization and owning equity in that organization. So technically, a lawsuit would have been suing ourselves. Um, so, you know, I guess the biggest lesson learned is if you're going to sell, sell and get the hell out, right? Don't hang around because mm. you ultimately get yourself in a position like that. Yeah. That's such a great point, right? Because I've also sold a couple companies and I don't stick around. Like, I'm like, I'm giving you a three month thing and I'm out. But, but, and also like, I don't think, well, some, it really depends, but to your point, you can get burnt, but like, let's say. For the purpose of illustration, that your your uh, transaction fee is ten million, right? But then your earnouts—they're going to promise you another twenty. Say, it's highly unlikely that you're going to hit 
you're going to get that 20. It's just another carrot to stick you around. And, I, and oftentimes what happens is when you sell your company, I found is that you discount that initial transaction fee, right? Instead of, you, instead of just going for 15, you take the 10 because you think, oh, you're going to get another 20 out. But that actually very rarely happens to your point. It's like it's a whole other thing. There's p other people, other, sometimes, you know, integration, culture, systems, and then, and then strategy, and you're no longer, in fact, you're not even in charge of the decision making anymore. So, how can you actually hit that, you know, that earn out number? If, you know what I mean? Like, it's just you're not in control yeah. anymore. You don't own the thing. Yeah. I mean, typically, earn outs are going to be based on the profitability of the organization moving forward for that earn out time, right? What the, well, here's, the, I mean, the situation is they don't have to be profitable. If they don't want to pay that earn out, they can hire a bunch of staff, they can increase their marketing expense, they can increase their executive bonuses, and you really have no control because you're no longer a controlling member of the organization. I like to equate it to the, like the lottery here, right? And, you know, people win the lottery all the time. And, you know, it's most of the lotteries here in the United States, it's like, if you win, you get two options. One is we could pay you the $20 million because you want a $20 million lottery, but you'll get that over 40 years. Or you could take 10 million now. You know, I, and I would be, and I advise everybody, it's like, take the 10 million now because hell, you don't know if you're going to be alive in 40 years or if the government's going to go broke by that time. But, you know, regardless at the end of the day, I didn't take my own advice. <laughs> Hectic, man. So Shannon, when you think about that whole experience, uh, you know, what insight or lesson do you now take forward with you into your business today? Well, I think, I think the lesson learned is, you know, if you're selling an organization for a reason, you know, people are selling the organization obviously because they want the money. That's great. But a lot of people sometimes sell the organization. It's not just for the money. Maybe it's burnout. You know, maybe they're ready to move on to something else, uh, make a, create a new challenge for themselves. So, you know, when you are selling an organization, think about the reasons that you sold that organization and that will prevent you from kind of sticking around too long. Because what ultimately happens is you're betting on the com and the com never happens, right? Um, you know, because you don't have control of the organization anymore. It is no longer your company, right? You're riding in somebody else's bus and you're in the back seat of that bus and you have no control over the direction of where it's going to go. So, you know, my advice moving forward is, you know, a, make sure you're checking everything a million times contractually, making sure that when you, when promises are made, that they're made in writing and get out as soon as you can. Move on to something else. Do something that, you know, you're going to be, that continue your success and, you know, continue your growth and education or whatever you want to do uh, with your life post acquisition. But it, it never really works out well um, when you stick around because at least you're, I mean, at minimum, it won't be a cultural fit. Mm. It hardly ever is. Mm. So true. So Shannon, if you could get into the Matt Brown show time machine and kind of go back to yourself when you didn't have the hindsight that you now do uh, and uh, give yourself a piece of advice or maybe do something differently, what would you do differently and why? Uh, the first thing I would have done is I would have made sure that the employment agreements of my staff were put in writing, right? The extension of those agreements were put in writing. That is the first thing. I'm very much the, – the first thing I'm always taking into consideration in any kind of liquidity event is what's going to happen to my staff. And it should be. Every CEO's you know, vision of that organization that they've sold that staff, they should live by their word and say, if this happens, I'm still going to take care of you. The second thing is I should have put a 90-day out, like, you know – I'll sign a consulting arrangement with you that I'll stick around for 90 days to make the transition smooth, you know, introducing you to the clients, the partners, the prospects, the staff. And, but after that, I'm gone. Pay me, pay me what you owe me, you know, none of this earn out stuff, um, you know, uh, and again, taking a lesser, and this was a, a significant transaction, right? So sometimes you get those dollar signs in your head about, about that earn out and you're not focused on exactly what you need to do right now, which is, Take, take what you can get and, and move on. Uh, and that, those would be the kind of the two things I would say um, that I would have done differently. Mm. I suppose this raises an interesting point of discussion, right? Because like, what's your number? You know, like I think that's a, it's an interesting yeah. thing to think about. Like, well, how, maybe there's always the number that you aspire to hit, but how much is enough? Like is 20 million enough or is that your number? Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? like and so like and you have to actually and also by the way if you if you're the type and i know what type of entrepreneur you are you build and sell um and if you're not that type of guy you know what i mean like selling can actually put you into the dirt like i spoke to 
um, Bo Burlingham, he wrote the book, uh, Finish Big. And he basically interviewed, you know, 300 entrepreneurs after they'd sold their businesses and like 90% of them go into depression because they don't have any yeah. sense of meaning or suffering anymore. Um, and so you have to know like, what's, how much is enough for me? Like, I remember I've basically fucked up because when I left South Africa, I had this business and I was trying to upload it and I had multiple offers that I didn't take because I was right. trying to get to the number and I wasn't thinking about, well, how much is enough? And so all those deals fell through and eventually, of course, now then I had to get on a plane and then you can't sell a business if you're not running the thing. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so that was a huge failure from my side, right? Because I wasn't thinking about, well, how much is enough? Let me just take this and like start another one. You know what I mean? Like yeah. why do you have to yeah. be so romanced about or idealistic about this number, you know? Yeah, I think I, I call it a BHAG, a big hairy ass goal, right? You got to have that goal and you got to have set that goal, but you got to understand what your minimum BHAG and what your real, you know, you know your, your ultimate BHAG would be. Um, you know, $20 million is a lot of money. I mean, most people can retire and they'll be fine for the rest of their lives. Me as being a serial entrepreneur, I'll never see myself retire. I, like, I'll work to the day I hit the, hit the ground. There's no doubt about that because just like you said, just being in, in that small transition of when I did exit that organization, to the six months that I started anew and life was fucking miserable, man. It was like, it's like, I have no purpose at all. So, you know, I'll continue to get to do these things, but I mean, you got to set those standards for yourself and understand that you can talk your way out of an acquisition. And I see it happen all the time. I've been a venture capitalist, capitalist now. I read probably four business plans a week and these people overvalue their business every fucking time. And I'm like, you'll never raise capital this way. Like your expectations, and I think this is happening, this is a trend that's happening across the startup community is you see you, these big exits of these organizations and you see all these people making these, these quick exits in Silicon Valley, but you gotta understand those are not realistic expectations, right? Just because somebody down the road got a 10 times revenue exit doesn't mean that, that your company is worth that. Mm. Um, but you know, they read these things, they read these books, they read these blogs, they watch TikTok, and they're like, oh shit, my company's worth 10 times revenue. And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> you own no intellectual property. You have no long-term contracts. There's no ARR. Like, you know, do your due diligence. You've got to do that. You've got to understand what you're worth and be realistic about it. Yeah. I spoke to about 50 general partners from venture capital firms here in the US uh, a few months back. And I kept <laughs> that point around the numbers, right? Like the forecasts, they all say no one hits those numbers. They don't. Oh, you know? yeah. Like no, a, they never do. You become, if, if they say they're going to be 100 million, like you come in at like half that. That's the top end. And then you can go half that, you know, 50 to 25. That's probably where they're going to be. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's it, but as you know what it is, it's natural. Your business is your baby, right? And everybody thinks their baby's pretty, even if they're ugly. Right? Everybody <laughs> says their baby's beautiful, right? So it, you're never going to get any people to back away from that. But what you got to understand, it's not your money, it's somebody else's money. And so they, <laughs> it, the worst thing that you can do, I think, is come into a situation where you're overconfident and over cocky, and that will drive somebody away. 100% of the time, because that person has to think I've got to deal with this person through this due diligence process. And they already don't understand what the fuck they're talking about. Right? Yeah. Preach, dude. Preaching. Preaching to the choir here, pal. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> what's your advice, Shannon, to um, other CEOs or entrepreneurs uh, about the importance of failing and becoming successful in business? Well, listen, I, I think there's several things. One is, as, as I said in the beginning, you have to find focus in failure. I think you can't be successful unless you fail because that's how lessons are learned. And here's the one thing you have to commit to yourself. You will never make that mistake again. I tell my staff this all the time. I'm like, listen, don't be afraid to fail. Don't come in here and ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. But when you do fail and you do ask for forgiveness, don't fuck up. Like, don't do that same thing again. You have to learn those lessons. I mean... You know, you got to give your staff the ability to be creative and do those things and take chances and take risk. And you've got to take risk yourself, but just don't take the same risk twice. You know, you jump out of an airplane, your parachute don't open. You're not going to get a second chance. Right. So, don't, um, you know, so what I what I would encourage them to do is surround yourself with people who can tell, you no. as a CEO, we tend to and I did this. I started my first company when I was 19. We tend to surround ourselves with people who want to kiss our ass all the time. Mm. Right. But that's the worst possible thing you can do. You need to surround yourself with people that you trust enough that can come and say you're not making the right decision. This is a bad uh, you know, direction of the organization and you will listen to them and you, you shut up and you listen. 
good CEOs listen more than they talk. And so those are the two things I think would be, you know, the, the biggest advice that I've learned is those people are more important, hire smarter people than you, let them do their fucking job, stay out of their way, and you be the visionary of the organization and listen to them when they speak. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. What about books, tools, podcasts, resources, things like that, that you recommend, Shannon? And I'm going to go old school on some of these books. So I think one of the best books I've ever read is Who Moved My Cheese? Um, I know a lot of people probably don't recognize that book these days. I think it was probably written in the mid 90s, but I think that's probably been one of the most impactful books talking about how what happens when things don't go right, right? And how to be nimble and transition from, from you know, one thing to another very quickly and not get stuck on the past or, or what's happened in the past. I think Good to Greats, you know, a great book. That's one of the all time classics. Um, from a podcast perspective, it's interesting. I'm very diverse. I, I, I basically listen to any kind of business podcast I can. Like I don't necessarily, I can't pinpoint a favorite uh, simply because I think, you know, advice can pop up from any situation, anytime, anywhere. Um, I don't get really entrenched in like, you know, these, these brand names. Cause I think a lot of times when you're listening to people who are kind of brand names or, you know, they're posting more on LinkedIn or they're doing podcasts. It's the same message over and over and over. I like to hear alternative views. So I'm switching channels all the time when it comes to the podcast. But those two books, I think, I think are probably things that have really impacted me and maybe make significant changes in the way I lead. Hmm. Amazing, man. Shannon, cool cat, brother, doing amazing things. Uh, super excited to see where you guys are going to go in the future already at a relatively high level of scale. So... Uh, here's to another liquidity event in the future, pal, and uh, wishing you and the team there all the very best of success. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. I enjoy your, your podcast. I, I've watched a few episodes. They're amazing. I'm going to continue to watch and follow you, and good luck to you as well. Awesome stuff. Everybody else, we'll see you again soon. Ciao for now.